Um, Libby Garrett is going to take the conversation over here. Libby's from the CETPA, California Educational Technology Professionals Association. Right, got it right this time. There we go. Uh, to talk a little bit more about what we're doing with student data privacy and how we can use the, the tool to um, get Washington and Oregon where California already is. Thanks, Libby. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to. Oh, yeah, I guess you need the microphone. Oh. oh, man. Sorry. My little mouse voice. Oh, it doesn't on. work. <laughs> So, as Ellen said, I work for um, SEDPA, which is the California Educational Technology Professionals Association. So, basically, in a nutshell, it's what the ACP does for you guys, but we do the, the same in California. So, a little bit about myself. Um, it kind of is a little comforting piece to, to let people know where I came from, and I came from where most of you guys are. I was a field technician for five years prior. Um, so anything from networking, VoIP systems deployment, device management, and of course, ed tech training. So wore many hats like you guys do. And then the um, California Student Data Privacy Compliance piece also landed on my desk. And I went home crying that day. <laughs> um, true story. Um, but currently, um, I'm the coordinator for all the resource programs uh, for SEPA. And so I work with uh, Microsoft Adobe licensing, um, any other consortium deals that we do with um, vendors. Um, we offer a JET review program with Q, which is um, a program focused more on the teaching and educational side of technology. And so we partner with them and do reviews of um, school districts and let them know how are you using your products, are you getting the best bang for your buck, are your students actually using the products, and where can we help you improve. Um, and then currently, of course, I'm the administrator for the California Student Data Privacy Alliance. So just a little bit about what we do besides what I've already explained resource program-wise. We offer educational programs. So um, about 13, 14 years ago, they realized that there is no training for somebody to be a CTO. There's no training. There's no schooling that they can really take that's really geared towards being a CTO. And so SEPA stepped up yet again and they created the CTO Mentor Program. And it is a master level program that um, a lot of our universities in the area actually recognize um, and transfer that credit over if need be. Um, but they prepare people to either become CTOs or to better themselves as a CTO. So it's a very really in-depth uh, mentoring program that we offer. Um, we also worked um, with TAPT. Um, so it's a program that offered um, through a grant in California, it offered services for districts to get training on anything technology. So we had Cisco trainings that were paid for through that grant, things like that. Um, and so we try our best to offer as many programs as we can to help technologists in California, but we also have the advocacy piece, and um, they work really diligently um, on those pieces. These are just a couple of our partners. Um, I'd really like to point out F3. They've really helped us a lot with this student data privacy piece. And then um, how valuable this information is going to be for you guys, um, but we have regional groups throughout California, um, and so we kind of meet uh, every other month, and we discuss whatever technology issues are going on, and that camaraderie is something that's really, really helped strengthen uh, technologists throughout the state. So we can have those conversations. So it's not just our conference once a year. It would be like this every other month in your area. So that's kind of what we've we figured out works really well for um, California. And then, of course, if you want to join us, we have our conference November 11th through, or I'm sorry, 12th through the 15th. Uh, last year, we had the Waz as our speaker. And this year, they um, got uh, Mr. Bill Nye, bow tie and all, as our keynote. Um, and I will be doing lots of data privacy pieces as well. So the goals for today are for you guys to Leave this session um, with thoughts and ideas on how to save your district money, how to save them time, and how to simplify the processes by using the, the tools that we've created in California and we're sharing um, for student data privacy. So Student Data Privacy Alliance, um, it, it was created to help us all collaboratively work together in districts to bring about awareness, education, um, but also to simplify the process. So some of the pieces that have hit the news recently. Um, the FBI warns ed techs 
specifically that we need stronger defenses for students. We hold some of the most valuable data, but it is the most vulnerable and is the most I don't want to say unsecure, but at times it can be. Because the way that school districts operate, we have a flow of data that goes both ways, right? We have data coming in, we have data going out, to where if you're looking at banks who are breached all the time, they don't have that flow like educators do. Um, and they still can't protect their data. So imagine now that we have that extra, you know, task of trying to keep all the students' data safe. Um, and so it's a little bit harder for ed techs, and so the FBI, um, actually put out that PSA, which they never do, and it was very specifically geared towards our department. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if my video will play. It didn't play last time. Quiet. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. Um, it was a video. I've shared this presentation on the app, and you guys can go in and play that video. It's a real event of a data breach that happened. I believe that one was um, a school back east, um, but it explains to you how it happened, what they did, what changes that they made to protect it, things like that. So it's really valuable real-time information. Um, this is a map of phishing attacks, data breaches, ransomware, uh, DDoS attacks, different types of things that are happening throughout the state. And then we're kind of starting to get into the meat and potatoes now of what is privacy, what is security? Everybody's answer is, that's not my job. Doesn't pertain to me, right? It's the tech department's responsibility to keep us safe. It's everybody's job. It's, they're all of our kids. It takes a village. It's everybody's job. But the best way to explain it is this little graphic down here. I was told I have a cool little laser thing. Um, so the security piece is um, you guys are the tech departments are building that hardware, that software, those encryption methods, and the best practices. So you guys are building the walls to keep everybody safe. But we have teachers, we have um, principals, and everybody else who have the keys to that gate, right? So they also have a responsibility. It's not just the tech department. You can build the strongest walls that you possibly can, but all these people have keys to it. What if they just let people write in? And so we kind of have to, I broke it down this way so that they can see that the policies, the procedures, the laws, and the best practices are their responsibility. So we all share responsibility, and this is kind of how it's broken down. So in California, we have a couple additional laws, but there are uh, FERPA and COPA, um, or federal laws that you guys are also bound by. Um, but the reason why I show this is so that you guys can see in 1974, the discussion about student data was completely different than it is today. And so you can kind of see the progression. In 1998, we had COPPA come about, um, and it started to talk about online privacy and why it's important and how it affects our kids. But in 2014, at least in California, um, we had SOPIPA come about, and it really drilled down into, it started to get into how are we using technology in schools, okay? Take it a step further, 2015, AB 1584 came out, and it required us to have a contract. Now, keep in mind, this is in California. You guys don't have anything like this that I know of just yet. And I say just yet because usually what happens in California kind of spreads. Um, so this, AB 1584, was the catalyst that really drove this conversation for student data privacy. Um, and so what it said was very specifically, um, educational technologists had to have a contract in place that very specifically had elements of what do you do in the event of a data breach? How is your da data being handled? What are they doing with it? How are they storing it? And all these different things had to be all listed out in this contract. And it very clearly says that it has to be a contract. That's the day I went home crying. Because <laughs> I also managed the MDM system, and I knew we had over 2,500 different applications, resources, programs that are being used throughout the district. How am I ever going to get a signed contract for each and every one of those? Um, and that's when I met my predecessor, Dana Greenspan. And she was working on this project um, with the uh, SDPC. And at the time, there were three states that had alliances. Um, and so California was the fourth state to join. So I quickly found out about them, and I hopped on board. Um, but having a contract was only the first part of it. So what do you do after you get that contract signed? Um, and so the California Student Privacy Alliance, or 
the Washington, Oregon, you guys um, operate the same way that we do it at this point. So transparency, um, huge piece in educational technology. Uh, your stakeholders, your superintendents, your school board members, they really, really want to see what's going on at all times and they want to know. Um, and so the database that they shared a little bit about brings about that transparency piece. It's a searchable database. So anybody from the public, whether it's a parent, a teacher, even a student themselves, if they want to check it out and see um, what data elements are being pulled from what applications, what programs have been vetted, which ones are safe, which ones have not been vetted, um, they can go in there and search. Um, the collaborative effort is a really big piece with that contract. We talked about Exhibit E and how if one district goes and has this contract signed, you can sign that one page document as opposed to going back and forth and going through that process that can take months and months and months. So that collaborative effort. Um, and then of course inventory. These videos will play, or they did last time. Um, and so the best way to educate my educators, my teachers, my staff, um, my districts in California is to create these little, they're about one to two minutes long so that people don't get bored, um, but they're a fun way to kind of explain what can be a very difficult concept. So I heard some talk about earlier, how do you talk to your stakeholders? How do you talk to your board members? How do you talk to them? And the easiest way to get the conversation going is to play this video and just let them know, in a nutshell, this is what it is, and now I'll answer your questions and we can talk about it. Um, we're gonna get to this, but that's my website um, where we offer all the resources. I don't wanna play it again. It's great, but it's not that good. Um, so these are some of the partners that we work with that we've talked about A4L, the SDPC, the Student Data Privacy Consortium, um, and then F3. Mark Williams has been instrumental in creating all of our contracts. You guys saw this graphic if you were here for the last session. Um, but we have 22 participating, 16 in the process, and 14 states that have not yet joined. Um, the big piece about this map is that you can see other countries have now joined. So we have Australia and New Zealand, and in those countries, there, there's a no tolerance policy with this. So if you don't sign the contract, you don't operate in that country, period, end of story. So they took a really, really hard stance on this. Um, it's working for them, I'll just say that. <laughs> I have some districts in California that operate the same way. Um, I caution them in, the, in California because not everybody's taken that stance quite yet, so you kind of tie your hands a little bit more where you might need that flexibility. Um, but I always explain to vendors, you have state laws that we have to comply with, but you also have school board policy. And some of our districts have taken the step to say, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't have the manpower to constantly be vetting hundreds if not thousands of contracts for resources that we're using. This is the contract we've chosen to use, this is what we vetted, and this is the only contract that we will review. So it just varies from state to state to from district to district. Um, these are some of our stats. Um, so currently, as of last night, I updated it. Um, for version one with Exhibit E, I have 1,347 contracts signed. Um, version one without Exhibit E, I have 111. Version two with Exhibit E, 168 contracts. So version two is, is fairly, um, it was, created about the same time I came on board in about August. Um, so slowly catching up. And then we have something that's called vendor specific. Vendor specific is an agreement where we have a vendor who requests red lines um, and it has to be vetted through myself and our legal team. Once we give the okay to accept those red lines, um, I attach an addendum 
to the front page of it that alerts all of our members these are the changes that were made and then both parties have to sign that. So that alerts our members right off the bat. There's been changes and these are the changes that were made. Do I agree or do I not agree? If they don't agree, they don't have to sign that Exhibit E. If they do sign the Exhibit E, they agree to the changes that were made in that contract. If they don't agree, then they can go um, back to that vendor and try to negotiate their own contract. So there's a lot of flexibility. Um, so one of the things that I did when I came on board, the training used to be a two-hour training, and they would cover all of these different topics, and it's just overload. Um, and so what I did was I broke up the trainings, and so now modules one and two you have to go through in California before you can get a login. Um, I believe this is some of the pieces that, um, is it Sandy? That's yes. going to be? Okay. So Sandy's going to be doing this for you guys. Um, but in California, this is how it operates for us. It may operate a little bit differently, but I spend one hour going over the contract. And at the end of that, I don't expect any of our members to know the contract inside and out, backwards and forward. But when I was in that position, I wanted to know at least a little bit about what I was talking about when I'm talking to a vendor about the contract. I don't want to be totally in the dark. Um, and so it's just meant to kind of introduce you to the contract. Module two, uh, we take you through how do, how do you upload a contract, how do you make changes, what are the different agreement types, things like that. And then those will usually take place on a Thursday. I give you your login that day, and then you have a whole week to go through the database, play around with it, see how comfortable you are with it, develop any questions, and that following Wednesday, so a week later, we get together in groups of five or less, and it flips. Instead of me talking at you and training you, um, that session is run by my members based on what their questions, concerns, what areas they're not quite comfortable with, things like that, and we go through everything to make sure that they're comfortable using the database. The thing is that it's a public database. So we have to be responsible and accountable to each other to make sure that our data that's going in is clean. Um, there used to be a really old text saying it was garbage in, garbage out. So you have to make sure that we're all trained and we're all on the same page when using the database. And then module four talks about those resource tools that they showed, a couple of them, um, where you can have your teachers so in California, we've trained teachers to go in to the database, and they search for the app. So they go to the conference. And they always come back with this huge list of applications that they want us to download and install for them next day they get back, right? So in the district I was with, we trained the teachers to use the database. And the easiest way for us to do that was to allow them to go to the, the district's website that they were already comfortable using. And we, we uh, use the resource tools that uh, the database gives us, and they can go on their own, their own school district website and search the database. So you're, you're setting that expectation. So they already know when they come back, what's the expectation? Has this app been vetted and approved? So I know it's going to go out next day or maybe a couple days later. Or if it's not on the list as approved, they know right away Okay, well, maybe I need to do a little bit of homework. Maybe I need to see if there's another app that does the same thing that's already been approved. And it kind of changes the expectation. When you change the expectation for them, they don't come at you so aggressively and angry when you tell them no. Because they already know. They've already searched. They already know what the answer is going to be. Um, and so that helped a lot when training teachers for the process. So my goals are always to simplify, educate, support, and advocate. And so as I said earlier, when we're talking to vendors, the conversations can go a little awry um, when I tell them, you know, sorry, I can't approve 22 red lines. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. Um, but then I try to educate them and help support them through the process. What can I do to help you understand this a little bit better? Because I don't have so much flexibility because these are laws. This isn't something that our superintendents just drummed up and kind of said, okay, now we're doing this. These are state laws that all of our districts have to be compliant with, and we're trying to find the easiest way for vendors to be compliant and for um, our districts to be compliant. So a couple questions I like to always throw out there. What if technologists could spend more time working on technology? When this landed on my desk, it pulled me a lot from the field because it's paperwork. It's a lot of going through and trying to figure it out. So what if they could spend more time working on technology? What if CBOs and directors could spend less time reviewing multiple contracts? What if teachers and admins had their requests fulfilled quicker? And what if we could put all this time, focus, and money back into the classroom where it belongs? 
So that was the goal of um, the California Student Privacy Alliance. Um, when I started this process in my district, the hardest part was we shut everything down. I know we talked about this, and if you guys were in here earlier talking to the keynote, you might be mad at me, but we told our teachers when they left for the summer, everything was being taken away. Everything was blacklisted, basically. It had to be. <laughs> everything was shut down completely. When you get your devices back, whatever has been vetted and approved is what you have access to until I can vet and approve it. And that was the only way that we could get compliant. So that being said, I preloaded them, I trained them, I worked with them, you know, April, May before they left for the summer. They turned in their devices to be cleaned and maintenanced and whatnot, knowing half the stuff they're used to using is probably going to be wiped out. Um, so we train them, I work with them a lot. You really have to get that buy-in from them and help them to understand why the process has to be the way it has to be to be compliant. And um, sadly, I guess I kind of use a little bit of scare tactic, but it's based and founded in truth that if you were a teacher, would you want to be that teacher that used the application you found out that leaked your student's data and they sold it and now all your student's data is just kind of floating around out there and you have parents suing the district because you were the teacher that used that application that wasn't approved and was selling the data in the background. They wouldn't know any better, but yet you're still at fault. So um, kind of have to get that teacher buy-in. You have to explain it to them. So I created this video um, to help train the teachers in that process, to help them understand we're not taking things away from you. We're changing the climate. We're changing the culture. <laughs> this is what it's going to look like now for the process to flow. trying to make sure that we're protecting our teachers from any um, lawsuits that could come about. Um, and so you really have to, you're changing a culture when you're really implementing the student data privacy piece. And depending on how your district operates and, and implements it, you could be changing and shaking up that culture for them. And so you really have to sit down and have those conversations with them and find out what's going to work and what's not. But you have to keep them a part of that conversation as it's developing. Um, and then, of course, you see those core elements through there, that searchable database, the transparency piece, and the inventory piece. That process looks totally different when you're introducing it to the tech side. Um, and so this was what we shared for training, um, how that process looks for technologists.
but then we dive into that studentdataprivacy.net. If you haven't already and you have a computer out, um, I, I would hope that you would go to studentdataprivacy.net and kind of bookmark that page. Um, a lot of the resources that I'm gonna share with you guys right now, they're all available for download there. The videos that you saw, the PowerPoint, everything is available for you guys to download, make it your own, and then implement it in your district if it's something that would work for you. Thank you, Slide. Now we're gonna kind of jump into uh, live demos here. And so um, the PC site operates very from there's really no place in there to kind of put these resources and share these resources. And so SEDPA has this homepage that we developed that um, kind of houses all those portions and all those um, things. So right here you could see that it gives you access. I'm not blocking. It gives you access to our homepage. So this would have taken you to the California homepage. And this takes you directly to that search. Um, I put notices um, whenever there is um, something going on. Do you guys use them? Okay. Okay. So, how many people know about the new library resource that rolled out probably about three, four months ago? So, how many people were kind of worried or upset about that new rollout if you're doing state of, student data privacy it was probably a big piece. Um, and what was happening was that um, while we're trying to be that secure front, right, we're locking down all the doors and windows and trying to get secure and, and practice, you know, good uh, student data privacy standards and things of that nature, uh, Clever <laughs> decided to create a new resource which was awesome and the resource has great potential. Um, it was just the way that it was rolled out was it flung that back door wide open. And so what it did was allow teachers to go in there and download and access any application, any program that was within the Clever database, free and clear, download it, use it in their classroom. Oh, and by the way, the people who are managing this, the IT you know, departments, the um, directors of IT, no idea what was going on. You can't see it in your dashboard. You couldn't see anything. No idea what was being used. So it took us back two years, basically all that work that had been done. So I put up a bright red clever notice, just like this one, but bright red. And the SDPC had let us know na nationally, be careful, because yes, they've signed the agreement, but we're, we're trying to figure out if that was a breach of the agreement or how that's going to operate because now we don't have any control. And in California, it actually says that um, in our state law that the school official, which would be the CTO in this case, has to be the person to choose what applications are being used in a classroom. They have to be able to approve and, and manage those applications. Um, and so that that broke that law basically. And so we had a lot of concerned people. So I put the notice up about a month later. I was at another conference and I left my booth. I came back and frantically had a, a note from the CEO saying, call me right away. So we called and had a conversation that was about two months ago. Um, and ever since then, they've been working really diligently with us to kind of correct the issue. Um, I don't credit that to myself. I don't credit that to just California. I credit that to the SDPC as a whole because they were getting people from every state. The SDPC, we actually had created um, a committee that was discussing this clever issue because it just lit everything up. And that's what the guy told me. He said when he talked to me, the first thing he said was, I know you have every right to have that notice up, but can you take it down because it's causing a lot of heat in my office. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, we'll work with you, but... Um, Secretly, I'm thinking that's the point, you know, because nobody was listening. And I don't think that um, in that instance, I don't think ever with a vendor, it's, it's meant to be malicious or they're meant to, you know, try and pull one over on us. I think that what happened in that scenario and what happens in a lot of scenarios with vendors is that 
usually at this level we're talking to salespeople and the salespeople aren't always talking to the CEO or the CFO nor do they have a say in a lot of stuff and that feedback's kind of getting lost in transition and so we just were talking to the wrong people the right hand was not talking to the left hand so once we got um, those connections going I, I changed it to a nice pretty blue instead of red <laughs> And um, we just basically had let people know um, we are working on a solution with them, um, and to just kind of be cautious when you're vetting that applic or that the new contract that they wanted them to sign for that new resource library. Just be cautious and have your own legal team kind of vet that out because uh, the contract that we had existing was not uh, valid because of the changes. So. Um, Things like that pop up, and this is a good way for us to kind of tell them. Um, I go through the training types here, and then they can sign up for training here. That um, public service announcement that the FBI has is right here that you can read yourself. Um, but down here is a really important piece I really want to talk about. So the CSPA library has all of these videos that we just uh, went through. The PowerPoint is in here. This is a new document that I created because a lot of people said the videos are great, but I need a step-by-step. -step. What do I need to do? How do I check the boxes and make sure I'm doing it right? And so in California, this is best practice. This is what we recommend. Um, so you attend the training. You get the login. Then you introduce this to your admins and your school board. Not to say that the conversations wouldn't have happened already. So this is assuming that before you even attend my training that you've talked about this and this is a step that your district wants to take. Um, so you go through the training, get a login. You talk about verbiage and how this is going to look and you develop your district's plan. Then you share the district's plan with staff. You start training your teachers. You start talking to them and preloading them with all the information. Then you gather the inventory. And I have resources that correspond to each one of these steps. So you gather the inventory, which is a nightmare because you guys are probably going to be like me and go home crying that day because you have thousands of resources that are just widely being used in your district and you have to vet all of them. Um, but that's where the CSPA comes in and you have that searchable database and you can gather and search by Exhibit E, so we'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, and you can use the work, even though you guys are in another state, you can use the work of other states. No, you won't be able to just easily sign that one document, but as I said earlier, if you have a vendor who is telling you no, they won't sign, but they've already signed with two other states, you have all that backing that they've already signed from all those states. And I'll tell you, if you talk to a vendor and you say, we're a district with this many schools and this many students, that's money. And you want to use it as much as they want to sell it to you, you just got to get there. And so that's where those conversations come into play. Um, then you'll per after you search for all the Exhibit E's, if you, whatever resources you couldn't find a contract for is where you would have to go out and um, do like a cold call basically, and, and talk to that vendor. And I provide the verbiage for the California people, and you guys are welcome to edit or change it or however you guys need to do. Um, but I try to make it as easy as possible because, again, IT professionals don't have the time to go through this whole process. And so I've taught them to copy-paste. They copy um, the verbiage into the email. They put the vendor's name. They send it off. It's super easy. Um, and then, of course, you want to keep track of those status. So this is um, the resource. I told you I have resources for everything on that list, and this is the best way to get started. After, of course, you have those conversations, um, you have to keep track of everything. And so this is just a really simple um, Excel file that I created. Um, and so you would put all of your app names, whether they're approved, not approved. And the exception piece is really important because in the, let's take um, students with IEPs. We have laws that we have to comply with with certain timing deadlines that if we have a student with an IEP and they say, you need to give them an iPad with X, Y, and Z application on it, you have to. You have to get that out there for two reasons. Not just because it's the law, but because you want your student to be performing as best that they can and that has been um, already vetted and said that this student needs this to be successful. So that exception column, that was pretty much the only exception I would make. I would go through and say, I have a student that has an IEP. I need to make the exception for student data privacy, but it also let me know that I needed to get on that one. I also needed to have an additional conversation with that teacher that's working with that student to let them know, hey, look out for this, look out for that. It's not been fully vetted, um, but we're going to go ahead and let him use it because he needs that for his, his learning capabilities. So this was a really good way to 
um, keep track of everything because you're not going to be able to, chances are, unless you're like my district, Oak Grove, um, that hired three people to sit there and do just this all day, you're not going to be able to get through very many of these before you get pulled out in the field for some fire that needs to be put out. Somebody's phone got unplugged and they said it's broken. Um, so all of that stuff is So again, this is a video that I created. Um, this one's a little bit longer than the others. Um, but we created app vetting teams. And the purpose behind the app vetting teams were that we were getting a lot of duplicate requests. And by duplicate requests, I don't mean this person and this person want to use the same app and they both put the request. I'm talking about you have five different requests from five different teachers that want to use an app that does the exact same thing. You have five different third grade math apps. Okay, can we, can we kind of like slim it down and pick one? <laughs> so um, what we did was we created these app vetting teams to kind of get those conversations started. I wasn't really hopeful that that would be something we can easily grasp, but they did. Because then I approached it, like I said, it's about how you talk to the, pre the people that you're talking to, right? You have to adjust your conversation to fit them. So they don't care that you're sitting there having to spend 10, 15 minutes trying to vet each and every one. But what they do care about is, okay, if you have to change classrooms in the middle of the year, or even worse, your student has to change classrooms in the middle of the year, are you going to want to teach them a new app every single time? Um, or are you going to just want them to kind of dive into the curriculum that you're teaching in that classroom because you just got a new student? So if we can kind of streamline it and approach it from that aspect to your teachers, it kind of was like that light bulb for them. So um, we're not taking away their say. We're, we're asking them to kind of get together, collaborate, figure out what app does what and which one is going to work best for you guys. So it saves the district time, saves the district money. And it's keeping that cohesive level for all your students, whether they move from this classroom to this classroom, or they have to move from this side of town to this school to the other side. It's all cohesive across the board. Worked really well. Banging down our door, but kind of. 
um, and they're like, hey, we need to get this agreement. Let's go, let's go. We gotta get this done, we gotta get this done. We're having a lot of pressure from districts. So again, there's the numbers game in this, right? So we have a lot of districts in California that are asking for these certain things from, from vendors, but not only in California. We are a nationwide, what, what was it up to? I can't remember now, 22 states, right? 16 in the process. That's huge. So um, we kind of go back and forth with the number games. You know, we're kind of coming out on top now because we all have these laws that we have to comply with. Um, and so they uh, got their agreement signed and they're happy now. Um, so now I'm gonna dive in here to the site. I know that there was a request to show um, how the process on the site. So this is the public, I'm not logged in. This is what your parents, your teachers, your staff will see. Um, and as you can see, we added that grade level and content area. That was a request by a lot of um, the district admins like myself because we are taking it a step beyond now and teaching our teachers, training our teachers how to use this on their own and how to do that first step of the process to vet on their own. So um, they would come in here, they can easily select what grade level, what content they are looking for, and that resource will pop up. Um, you can search by district, you can search by agreement type, which is what I recommend if you're new to the process. Um, you can search by resource and you can search by company name. Do you guys know the distinguishing difference between those two? Company name, resource. So take McGraw Hill for instance, we were talking about how they signed the agreement. McGraw Hill is the company name. But we all know they have however many different programs underneath. So those different programs would be listed as resources and McGraw Hill's the company name. The reason why that's important is because you wanna keep that inventory clean for your teachers. A lot of them may not know that it's a McGraw Hill product, but they know what specific resource they're looking for. So if you list it as McGraw Hill, they're gonna put a new request and say, hey, you don't have my resource, but in reality you might. So you have to really kind of watch that when you're uploading. So in the, in the event of, um, I'll use A to Z Learning. So A to Z Learning has a to Z learning as a resource and they have Raz Kids as a resource. I used both in my previous district. So yes, I had to take that extra step of uploading the identical contract, but I did it under A to Z learning and then I did it again for Raz Kids so that my inventory was clean and my teachers um, would know, hey, I'm looking for Raz Kids. They may not correspond those two. Process, the best way to come in here is to come in here and search by um, the contract with exhibit. Um, in California, we have the new contract version two. And so I tell people come in here and the first thing you wanna do is search version two with an exhibit. It's gonna give you a really long list. And you can tell who's the originator by that target right there. That means that's the originator. You can also tell um, by that extra link that's down here, it has two links. Um, and so, let me see. What you would do, I'm gonna come in here and find my Oak Grove people. So, Oak Grove breakout EDU. And so this is the originating contract. Let's see if I can use this little guy. So this would be the originating contract, that first one, and down here should be that clean exhibit E that you guys should be able to come in here and say, okay, I use that product, I need to print this out, I need to fill it all out. So what I would do is fill out in its entirety as much as I could for my boss. I wasn't the signer, my boss was, but what I would do is do a stack of these. I'd take him the stack and he'd sign off on all of them and then I'd spend the afternoon uploading. And then you'll have to log in. So once you're logged in, you're going to want to make sure that you're on your state and not the national database. So right now I'm on the national database, and I know that because it says SDPC Resource Registry, and that's where it's automatically going to take you when you log in. So you're going to want to come here, click your state, and then you're going to want to go to that Alliance homepage where that changes to have your state across the top. Once you do that, you're going to want to come in here to um, Resources which is the second tab, and you're gonna want to, oops, sorry, I lied, third tab, uh, your district's agreements. 
and then you're going to want to add a new agreement. So before you do this, you're going to want to make sure that the resource that you're adding is already in here. If you are a subscriber, you've already gone through the process of searching for your exhibit E, obviously you know it's in there. If you're the originating district is where this plays a big role, so you have to go in there and actually search and make sure that you are absolutely the first person to um, upload a contract for that resource. So in the event of being a subscriber, somebody's already the originating district, you just uploaded your, downloaded your Exhibit E, you have the contract. So you can say, yes, I have the contract. You're gonna wanna find what resource that you're looking for. And again, right here, it reminds you, if you don't see your resource in this list, you have to go through the added process. I'm gonna sit down because I feel like I'm blocking your view. Sorry. Um, so right here, it reminds you, this. This database when they, so it just changed about two months ago um, and they made it really user friendly. So it reminds you right here, you need to add the resource because it's not in the list and you can just go right here. You don't have to click out. This piece is really important so that your teachers can search properly. So this is K through three and this is how your, your district is using this application. This is not necessarily what the application is capable of as much as how your district is using it. If you have an application that um, it can do English, language arts, and math, and you guys aren't using it for math, don't put math, because then your teachers are gonna search and say, but you said that we use it for math. So you wanna really streamline this for what you're using it for in your district. These pieces right here, if you're using the resource tools, um, and having the teachers go to the district website to place their request and it comes straight through, um, this will already have been filled out for you. If it's not filled out and you're not that far in the process, you can always fill it out manually. Um, right here requires a media release. So our contract, I don't know about you guys, you might wanna clarify, but our contract does not cover SIPA. Did you guys add anything in there for SIPA? Okay. So the contract does not cover SIPA. It's very specific to student data privacy only, and we did that on purpose. Um, but being that this is a, a database that we want you guys to use for inventory purposes, we have a place here where if you're using, um, I don't know why, but some schools still use first person shooter um, type of applications or graphic content for older kids, stuff like that. Um, and if your district allows it, we have some, um, you are gonna need a SIPA parent release um, for any kid to use that type of graphic um, application in a school. And so right here you can say yes and later on it'll give you the access to upload your SIPA agreement. So while our agreement doesn't touch SIPA, we want you to have one database where you can house all these agreements for your parents to search. So then you'll hit save um, and then Right here, once it, um, so this is what it looks like if you go into your manage agreements. So it automatically takes you there once you um, upload the agreement. If you want to get to this place, um, after the fact, you can go to your district agreements and click on manage agreements and all your agreements will show up. So right now it's listed as a new request. You can change the agreement type. So the agreement type is, do you guys have these different agreement types? Yep. You guys, yes? Well, I mean, they're listed on ours. They are listed? Was that your question earlier? Uh-huh. Okay. So um, not to backtrack, but I'm gonna show you a video before I go into all this. Um, and it explains the different agreement types. I wasn't sure if you guys use different agreement types. So this will explain to you the different agreement types that are available.
does that kind of help answer that question from earlier about agreement types? Is that helpful? I don't know who asked, or who asked it. Okay, so um, that video is available to you guys at studentdataprivacy.net. Um, and I like to create the videos because I'm not always available. Obviously, if somebody's trying to call me right now, I can't get back to them right away while they're trying to upload their agreement. But it's really, really important to understand what the different agreement types are and if you're the originating or subscribing district. Um, because, again, it's a public database and we're sharing the database and so we need to make sure that we all have a clear understanding of how we're uploading. Libby, if you had, you could also use this as a repository for I've just, for whatever reason, agreed to the base agreement from the vendor. I would click on other agreement type here and make note of that. Yeah, so in the agreement type video, um, in California, I wasn't sure how deep you guys got into it, but so we have the typical standard and we have the vendor specific, which is approved red line, but we also allow this to be, like he said, the, for the inventory piece, the repository for all your agreements. So let's say that your district superintendent said, I don't care what it takes, we have to use this application, but let's get some type of agreement, even though they won't agree to the full agreement. Um, in that case, it would be district modified, and district modified is where we can't approve it um, as a, an, um, entity or we can't approve it the CSPA can't approve it there's too many red lines but you guys still want to use it in your district then you have your specific legal team uh, vet that contract and once you guys are okay with it it's co considered district modified nobody else can use that except you guys there's no exhibit E um, but you can upload district modified contracts customized is typically it will not look anything like our contract and typically it's provided by the vendor um, and some school districts sign them and they find them to be okay. Um, I don't have very many in, in my database just because my districts have me to kind of be their little pit bull and kind of get all the contracts signed. Um, but there are customized agreements and there are districts who um, will accept a customized agreement. And so, again, we're trying to make this the end all say all for your inventory, right? So your teachers and your stakeholders know where are you at with the vetting process for specific applications so you can totally upload those. And that's also a place where you would indicate things like the client, which would be really helpful for mm -hmm. the teachers, because then they know it's not that I haven't gotten around to it. Right. We've actually said these guys aren't going to work. Right. And I'm, I'm working on a piece where we can do like a thumbs up, thumbs down, so that when I contact somebody who's declined, I can say, hey, look, you've declined five times. You've declined 10, 15, 20 times. That's 20 districts that you're failing to be able to work with because you refuse to sign. So it kind of gives me a little bit more leverage and a little bit more of that numbers game behind it. Um, because in a lot of cases, anybody who declines, um, they've declined more than once, more than five times, more than ten times. And so um, maybe that's information, again, maybe for that company right hand not talking to the left hand. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they're not aware that they're not able to do business with that many school districts. So, again, um, it's about educating the vendors as much as we're trying to educate each other. Um, so it's really self-explanatory. You walk straight through. Um, you can view all your state. You can view, now I'm just kind of reiterating what they talked about in the first um, session. Um, is there anything, I'm going to kind of open it up for questions. I know we only have 20 minutes left and I know there's probably a ton of questions. Um, and I'd rather be very specific in what I show you guys based on your questions and to kind of just fumble through it. No? <laughs> He's just thoroughly confused. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it's meant to be super quick and easy. It's not always going to be that easy. Um, and I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure um, how you guys, you guys might want to reiterate, you're going to have people at districts that are doing the process, or do you have... Uh, that's, what we, that's what we have at this point. We don't have any kind of centralized group. Sorry. I didn't know if you wanted it. I'm hogging oh. it. <laughs> oh, we don't have anything centralized yet in Washington, and I don't think we're in Washington either. Something like what you guys have, where someone just works on this. So, we're, you know, we're still... ...up at, at this point. I think that's... Um, 
it would be better if we had a one, uh, if we had a Libby that was negotiating the contracts, so you'd have consistency throughout this. I think that would be a big advantage. We don't have that yet. Um, it'd be nice if we can get there at some point. But, um, I'll nominate you. Is there a second? Will you? <laughs> yeah, will you guys pay my salary? I would rather do this than, uh, than worry about uh, filters and things like that back in the district. Um, yeah, so uh, Bethel's going to sponsor me to do this work. That's going to be awesome. Big pay increase, I heard. That's mm -hmm. sweet. Whatever you want. I, yeah. Play chess. Sky's the limit? Yes. Yeah. Um, no. That, I, uh, I, heard, I, heard I got all sorts of chips I can pay you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that Jeff's not here, you heard it was Sipsy was yeah. I mean, actually, the, I'll, that, give you, I'll give you Marty, Marty's phone number. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. I'll talk to Marty about that. Uh, it would be a good idea. This actually would be something that our ESD st structures in Washington and Oregon, talking to them, that's something that they could get behind. I would even go so far as to say if there's some kind of funding model. Because, you know, we're not going to contact with SIPSI or contact one of the ESDs and say, take this on for no extra money. There's dollars involved with it. But the idea of us spreading the, cro the costs across the organizations, I think there's some real advantage to that for any yeah, any of you um is i and you may have talked about this and i missed this i've been i've been at a few of these but is it a recommendation that each district takes exhibit e um to their legal <coughs> group and just have them look at it once or is it per application um how what's the recommendation so in California, what they've done is this has kind of become the de facto for mm -hmm. a majority of our districts. I'm like up to 1,112 districts in California that have signed on to this alliance. So that many districts in California have used this as they vetted the contract one time through their CBO or their purchasing or their superintendent, whoever needs to sign off on it. And the only time they have to take it back to their school board or the only time they have to take it back to be vetted is if there's changes made. So again, there's that additional buy-in from the districts that they don't have the time or the pay or the, the money or the manpower, the people, to go back and forth with contracts, and so that's what they've done. They've got it vetted one time because it never changes. Now, if there's changes, then they have to take it back to their school board and their superintendent and things like that. And in, in, at least in, in North Shore, the process I used here, which is maybe a little shaky, is um, I took it to our director of purchasing. She's a she's a lawyer. She doesn't she's not our legal counsel, but she's a lawyer. She reviewed the contract. She had some some modifications to make for it also. I took it to my boss, uh, the deputy superintendent for the district, and he signed off on the concept. But they've also empowered me to make small modifications to the agreements, which is good because I've been doing that anyways with these other privacy agreements all along because nobody else in, this is I mean this is honestly this is probably how a lot if anybody's doing this at the district level with one person you've probably been negotiating these agreements already with these vendors anyways and signing these things off this was just me saying okay I'm going to work with this vendor and instead of modifying their base agreement for us we're modifying this other agreement by small amounts and that's where then if there's too many changes, I push back on it and say, you know, I can't sign off on this because now you're really fundamentally changing what our district has agreed to. So if it's just small pieces, I might agree to it. Or, or also I'll shoot Mark Williams um, from, uh, from F3 uh, an email and say, Mark, what do you think about this? And he almost always comes back with, uh, with good uh, counsel very quickly. Um, but I would say to start it, make sure somebody in your organization who's a little higher up the food chain than, than, than you is signing off on the idea. I mean, unless you're the superintendent, um, and Morlock's not here, so I don't think any of us are, then you probably want to have somebody be aware of what you're doing. Uh, I think that's right, which is probably Yeah. It, if you've got legal counsel, it's a good idea. Um, I would say for the for signing the Exhibit E, though, once you get them on board with the concept, I don't think you need to take Exhibit B, E back to them every time. Unless there's big changes. Yeah. What's, what's big changes? Well, big changes, I mean, I guess, uh, what, what would I say would be a big change if somebody has? Oh, uh, like if we had, if you have somebody who says, because uh, I had this, it says, well, oh, there's a certain amount of this data that we're going to go ahead and retain after we say that we're not going to do business anymore. Um, and for this vendor, it was kind of because we already do that. And I said, holy crap, not only are we not signing this agreement, but we're not using your product anymore because your agreement that you have in place says you're not doing that. Well, you just told me you're already doing anyways. So um, 
So that was a little, that was a little creepy. Oh, but that, that actually does bring up a point, and this is like where we go with this next. There's a, uh, you guys are probably familiar with the idea of trust but verify, right? Okay, Con contractual agreements are trust relationships, right? You, we all agree that we're going to do these things and we take each other at our, at, on our word and at face value that if, if I say I'm not gonna do this, I'm not going to do this, and you know, if I say I will, I'm going to do it. The next piece of where we m might want to think about going with this, and this is where SDPC is, is going also, is that verify piece. You know, how do I confirm if you said you're going to purge this data, you actually have purged this data? How do I know that if you said, here's the only data that you're going to grab, that this is the only data you're going to grab? Because a lot of these products say, um, I'm going to authenticate your kid by accessing through Google or through, God forbid, Facebook or something like this where they actually get access to a heck of a lot more data that way than you probably want to give them. And you're trusting them that they don't take a lot more than they told you they were going to, but how do you verify they didn't you know, grab the whole kitchen sink there? That would be, I think, probably the next place we want to go is, is be sure what they've done. Yeah, for sure. Um, just if you were asking about changes, so um, people either like me or very much dislike me in California at this point. <laughs> um, because I'm pretty hard when it comes to changing the contract because I explained a little bit earlier that you have state laws and then you have school board policy. And even though I've cautioned the districts to open that can of worms of making it their school board policy, some of their superintendents just grabbed on and they were all over it and they're acting like Australia and New Zealand and there's no flexibility for them. So their next step was make it their school board policy. With that in mind, I got even more stringent on what changes I would make to a vendor specific because now I know that those districts are going to have a really hard time using that contract. So um, this is an example of um, the addendum um, for Power School um, and one of my school districts. And it is a vendor specific. And anytime there's even one change made, it's vendor specific so that people are alerted there was a change. But this is an example of a very small change that I made. So um, the part in red is the change. It's one sentence. But um, they said, you know, we have an issue with it doesn't stay from the time that we know about it. What if the data breach happened two weeks ago and we found out about it today? Are we in trouble now because you said that from the time of the data breach? And so I said, okay, that's a reasonable request. And we went ahead and conceded and we made that change. And so it's very clearly stated now that um, after the confirmation of the incident. So that's like a really, really small change. And one of the other changes I make a lot um, is where it says not to exceed 48 hours. So they have 48 hours from the time of the data breach to alert you to the data breach. Um, I've changed that to 72 hours for a couple vendors. Um, and those are all things that are, they're common sense. Um, and if we, well not if, when we do a version three, those are probably changes that'll be implemented because they're very accurate um, and they, they do make a lot of sense and they're not a huge ask. So when I say I make changes for vendor specific, it's very small. And they're still within the spirit. And it has to stay within that scope. So that's an example, and this will be page one of um, the vendor specific. So very clearly, um, any district that wants to sign that exhibit E can clearly see this is the change that was made. Do I agree or disagree? There's no searching through the contract or anything. It's right on top. That's a new piece. I can share that with you guys as well. True confession on one thing in Oregon. So um, the version one that's our Oregon agreement uh, there was a little bit of a disconnect when Washington started and Oregon started based on the California agreement and we should have both sort of started in the same place but somehow there was a little bit of a shift in the document and so Oregon got a different version than California, or Washington did and Oregon's is slightly built more on V1 of California and Washington's built more on V2. Bottom line for Oregonians, we're working on getting AV2, we're looking at the Washington Agreement and the California Agreement and trying to consolidate the difference in language. 
and then we'll get an Oregon V2. It doesn't mean the V1s are no good anymore right. that we've already done. We don't have to redo them. But going forward, we would use that V2. And then as um, Libby highlighted that sentence in red might be good potentially for all of us yeah. to add to our base agreement from the time of discovery. But it's really difficult when you're a solo district and you're trying to track your own changes to mm -hmm. follow this. Yeah. Um, something else that just popped in my mind right now when you were talking about the contract. In the contract, it actually says that this contract supersedes all other contracts, and it very specifically talks about the EULAs. So if you have a teacher who's still downloading their own applications, maybe you haven't logged it down, you're not that type of district, um, you want to be very careful because if we didn't put that this contract supersedes all others, the teacher could, in essence, go and download a different application that you don't, that you may already have a contract for, um, but then they say, oh, well, they signed the new privacy policies when they downloaded it, so that would supersede. So we had that conversation and issues start happening, so we added that into version two as well. That's already in Washington. It supersedes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very specific. It says any conversations, any contracts, any um, privacy policies, anything. It supersedes all. Um, or something else. Oh, so... Most I saw a couple vendors already leave, but <laughs> <laughs> in a huff. <laughs> the purpose of the contract is not to be so. It is a my job is always to work on behalf of the LEAs or the school districts. Um, those are my members. That's who I work on behalf of to negotiate the contract. However, we work with vendors um, and we invite vendors to give feedback and things of that nature. That's why we ask them to join um, the SDPC and become a part of that conversation. Because we literally sat down at a table when we created the contract. And even when we updated to version 2 in California, we sat down at a table or via, you know, webcast with vendors, with LEAs, advocates, and our legal teams. And we all kind of go through it and say, what's working, what's not working? Where can we make changes that would make it easier on the vendor side? Because the vendors also have not laws, but they also have guidelines that they have to work within for their companies, right? And it would be really beneficial to get that feedback and input from them so we can say, okay, that's one less hurdle that you guys as vendors have to jump, and then we as districts have to jump over to get this agreement signed or agreed to. And so when we changed from version one to version two, that feedback was instrumental and played a lot of, um, it, it played really heavily into um, the changes that were made to version two. And so the feedback that I get is, Vendors who refuse to sign version one will very quickly jump onto version two. And it's just really small changes, but sometimes those changes that make sense um, on the vendor side, and maybe it was an oversight on our part because we're not dealing in that arena every day. Um, so it's really important for if, you, if you're getting no's from vendors, find out why. Have those conversations so that we can say, you know, is it something that we're just working with a difficult vendor? Or do they really, really want to be able to sign it and we just kind of have to meet in the middle and maybe we need to con you know, make some changes or, or whatnot. But that feedback is really, really instrumental. Any other questions? I think I bored everybody to death. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. right. When is that training that was going to be held? There was a screen. It's in May 23rd and June 20th. And is that posted somewhere? It, uh, uh, Sandy sent the message out to, to the ACPE list. I saw the list. Yeah, a couple of days ago. Okay. You may not have seen it because we're all here. Um, but I, I know she's also going to send it out again afterwards, after she sent it before and after. So. I'm doing the May 9th if they would like to join. They're welcome. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So um, I was doing these trainings every Thursday. Um, it's now conference season, and I've been traveling every Thursday instead. Um, and, but I do have one scheduled for May 9th, and you guys are welcome to join. You just have to go to that studentdataprivacy.net. It's about halfway down the page, and it says if you'd like to join training, click here. And I can send you the invite and the link for that. It's a webinar um, training, and you guys are welcome to join. It will be a little bit different, so, um, but it might be a good way to kind of get your feet wet. And then when you train with Sandy, you kind of already know a little bit about what's going on. May 23rd, 3 to 4.30, and June 20th. And we'll, we'll send that out, and also we get a reminder mm -hmm. that you can join Libby's event also. That's very gracious. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.
Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, I really enjoyed the conversations and hearing the feedback um, from you guys. And if you have any more, um, I have business cards if you'd like to uh, get in touch or definitely check out that website. Everything that we talked about and touched on is downloadable and you guys can edit as you need to um, and, and form that for your districts. So thank you. Thank you.